so it's stinking pretty. Was not expecting those to come in that size. Sitting out here trying to get my poof back onto this microphone. It just, it doesn't want to stay on there. That's always been a thing with me with these Rode mics. Really good microphones, don't get me wrong. But the poof, getting them to stay in there, so obnoxious. Very really obnoxious. I cut myself off as I was saying that. Hey, what's up, Garden Friends? Jeff here. How's everybody doing? If you're doing well, I'm great. Sitting outside. Gorgeous day. The high today is only like 80. Very unusual. It's supposed to be in the 70s and low 80s for the majority of the week, which is great because we've got some stuff to do that I would rather do when it's cooler outside than when it's hotter outside. Right now, I'm sitting down with all the plants that I just filmed for the video that will have more than likely been out right before this one. Here's what I want to do this week. I have a gorilla cart full of stuff over here and I need to get all that out because I need the gorilla cart to use for mixing soil because I have things that need to be repotted and potted up. So I need to go down here to my berm and use the materials in that gorilla cart to try and do something to help build up. You can even see from here how it dips down right there. It's because there's a walkway there. That's also the point where the backyard floods. Everything flows over that spot. So I'm going to try and do something with the bricks in that gorilla cart that I picked up from the garden in last week's video, last Saturday's video, to build that spot up. And then I need to go to the hardware store and get some mulch to tackle the shade garden over here and get that looking nice and maybe hit up a nursery and pick out some plants to go into the shade garden to start some stuff over there. So on the fence about that yet, yeah, I need some more time to think about it. And I also have a bunch of stuff that I would like to set up over here by this green wall. Since I put this green wall up, I have noticed that all the stuff I have on the table just disappears and fades right into it. So I'm gonna change up the color scheme. I have a new lantern that's really tall with some light colors, maybe fill it up with some lemons and maybe a linen table runner or something. I don't know, gonna play around with that. Uh, I think the first thing that I should do though is probably work on this footpath situation down there. Anyways, as I was saying, in other news, what's been going on, filmed this video yesterday, the first five minutes, great. And then I took a pause to get all my notes down. I just, I posted, I did post-it notes for everything, just the highlights of what I need to talk about for each plant. And then uh, resumed filming. That second part was only like 20 something minutes. I did a very good job <laughs> with that. Sometimes when you make a video, you just, you have the flow and you just go through it. No problems, no hiccups, no having to repeat yourself. It was a really good take. 20 minutes smooth. I think that it would have been one of the easiest things in the world to edit. I went to watch it back. There's no audio. Not for the second half. There was for the first half. And by the time I was done filming, it was getting dark out, so I just had to stop and figure I'd redo it in the morning, which I did. Second take, not as good. I was stumbling on my words and just more hyperactive, I think, not quite as laid back, so I wasn't flowing as well. That just happens sometimes. What happened is, I've learned this is a new microphone. So I've used Rode mics before, but the one I was using was just the original Rode that came out like forever ago. This is the newer wireless pro. I do really like it. One thing I like about it is that when you hook it in, so like right here, I have an adapter so that I can use my phone for recording and the microphone. When you hook it in, it turns on on its own, which is great. But the transmitters, this is the part you put on your shirt. So the wireless aspect of it, it does not turn on on its own. But there's a screen right here to show you whether or not they're on. So I click this button right here. And then it says, you see the M? Okay, so this is the part that goes to the camera. And then you turn this on, and this is microphone number one, so number one should light up. And then the little pieces move as you're talking, so you know that you're getting good audio, right? What I didn't know, though, is that since I turned the phone off when I was cutting between what I was doing, that that then turned this off. And then when it turned back on, when I put the microphone back in, this piece doesn't automatically turn back on. It does automatically turn off though. So lesson learned, learn something fun there. Also completely forgot that one of the reasons I wanted this microphone is because it has a record function on there. I think it even says record on here. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Can you see it? Yeah, record right above the power thing. See right there? Which means that if I had thought about it, I could have just set this to record so that I would have that audio should something not be transmitting properly. I just wasn't thinking. But hey, new technology, this is how we learn, trial and error. I do really like the microphone, I just screwed up big time. 
okay, it's kind of on there now. It just, it's hard to clip it into place. And then in other news, before I filmed the video yesterday, I got around to filming it late. The plants had to sit in the box for many hours extra because we had a sewage blowout in the basement. That was disgusting. It wasn't like fecal matter. It was like pipe bile. It still smelled absolutely horrible. The entire house smelled bad. It was funny though because initially I just thought it was the kitten because she just has the most rancid BMs I've ever smelled in my life from a cat. You can't smell it around the house when she uses the litter box. But then uh, I, I was in the kitchen. I was outside, went inside, and I was like, oh, that smells terrible. Went upstairs, and I could still smell it. And then uh, I uh, was like, huh, I don't think I should be able to smell it in the kitchen, upstairs in the bedroom, in my office, in the upstairs master bathroom. Like, it was everywhere. I was like, uh, I should probably go downstairs and like just hoping that there isn't sewage pouring from the ceiling or out from a wall somewhere in the house. And there wasn't. It was just the floor drain. Does that, do you know what the floor, do you know what I'm talking about? Not everybody has a basement and a lot of homes are set up differently. Like I know some people further south, your AC units are in your attics and stuff. Whereas here in the Midwest are usually outside the house. So I don't, I don't know. But the drain it's something that is plumbed into the sewage it's in the ground in the unfinished portion of the basement and it allows for the runoff from the hvac unit so there's a portion of the basement that has the ac units basically the big blowers for the furnaces and the dehumidifiers and humidifiers and the like the uv filters and air filters all that stuff is plumbed and it goes around the ground and it just that way it can just drip into that pipe that's in the ground. Well, that pipe, I went downstairs and it was surrounded in like, a, I don't know, a six, seven foot long by like four to five foot wide, just field of ugh. It was really gross. Went around the house, flushed all the toilets multiple times, like make sure that there wasn't a clog in the line somewhere, which just wouldn't have made sense because where that drain is, is basically the end of the line. It's where all the sewage gets removed from the house so i mean it could clog there there are traps and things in there but that it would be narrowed down to a specific toilet wouldn't really have made sense it'd be more that the clog was annoying anyways got it cleaned up and the consensus seems to be from everybody else that I've spoken to about this is that chances are somebody down the line had somebody doing a pressure check and it blew up a bubble through our line so like a big old just bloop like the sewage line burped into the basement which that ugh, it smelled so bad but now the house smells better than it ever has because i lit about eight candles and opened almost all the windows downstairs and had fans going so it's just my main fear was well one that there could be a huge issue somewhere in the house you don't want sewage lines to blow out in your walls that's really bad right luckily that's not the case the second big concern was that smell sticking to things to fabrics and just whatever. And now the house smells like pine saw, Lysol, uh, the green safe stuff that you use. I don't remember what it's called. Stuff you use in the birdcage. What's it called? I don't remember. That plus the candles, all the windows being opened yesterday. Thank goodness it wasn't a scorcher. It was only like 82. So I was able to have all the windows open for several hours. It really did a good job of just freshening up the house. Everything inside smells so good and clean now. Now you're up to date with what's been going on with me. Uh, Toby older dog he has surgery coming up in a few days which might make the video shorter it just depends on what his post-op conditions are going to be like gonna have to keep an eye on him i'm sure not gonna be able to let him go up and down the stairs for a while which means he's gonna be a barking mess for a long time because he does not like to be left downstairs but you gotta do what you gotta do he's having a big white pomer removed and when i say big i mean big the thing is huge i am so excited for him that the vets finally agreed to go ahead and take the thing off of him, which they had to, had to wait so long. They really should have just removed it, but multiple vets said, nope, that it wasn't necessary, and now they're like, oh yeah, we need to get that off of him. Maybe just remove it before it gets to the point where it looks like it's something terrifying that's gonna rupture. That would have been a good idea. Yeah, so I don't know for sure what's going to happen in the video because I have to take into account Toby, but I mean, I think everything should be fine. That's a lot of earwigs. Whoa. Big ones, too. I mean, this makes sense. Wet wood. Seems like something earwigs would really enjoy, doesn't it? 
And here are my scraps. So anything that's wide enough, I want to try and use and basically lay down a path underneath that path. And then when I go to the store and get the mulch, get some gravel to fill in the gaps. And this is all basically just for erosion control. I'm not necessarily going to try and level it all together because I'm just going to put the wood path back on top of it because the dogs, Toby, coming back to Toby, that's why I even started talking about him, uh, he doesn't like stepping on the stones. He prefers the wooden path thing there. So that's all that's going on there. I don't know. It's not the most terribly exciting thing. And cosmetically, it's not going to be all that nice to look at either because I'm not really going to be digging it out because this is mostly leveled. I see a pit in here that could be an issue. My main thing is to just have these in here, fill it in with gravel, get mulch and stuff on the outside of it so it'll help hold it in place and then hopefully that will raise everything up high enough because it only needs to come up a few inches. That'll keep the water from gushing over through the spot and flooding the yard when we have really bad storms out here. That's better. Been bothering me. I don't like having the gorilla cart full of stuff. Yeah, it's not meant to be aesthetically appealing. Remember, this is supposed to be an underlayment for erosion control. And I'm thinking when I go get gravel to fill in all the gaps, I need to get some sand to put underneath these as well. I'm going to take rubber mallet and hammer them down because there are some spots where they aren't quite level. Not that it really needs to be level. The main thing is that there's something in this area so that when we have heavy downpours or just general rain in general, this is for erosion control because this is where everything likes to erode and dip down. I'm always filling it in every year with more soil, trying to lift it back up. Won't have to do that as much with this. And over time, there will still be erosion, but you can fill back in with gravel and everything. That'll keep it looking nice. This is, like I said, it's not meant to look nice. This is just for erosion, erosion control. And we can finish that up. Then we make it to the hardware store and get some mulch and sand and stuff. Here we are, mulch time, and yeah, bad news. Had to go to Lowe's. Home Depot's gates were closed because they don't have a cashier today. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with Lowe's, it's just, you know, I mean, come on. Their plant selection sucks. Not all of them. Pretty much just the ones that I go to. Y'all sent me pictures from Lowe's all the time and it looks like they have amazing stuff, but that, that's not the case here. It doesn't really matter. I'm just getting mulch. I don't really think there's going to be anything to look at plant-wise in here anyways, but if there is, you'll we'll, we'll see it. Right now it's just stuff that's set out for fall way too early in August. It's not, it's not fall yet. This is unnecessary. Don't need the mums out yet. I don't mind the peppers. The peppers are cute, but still, stop it with the false stuff. I mean, there's some stuff. It's just not good stuff. The front of the store is nothing but mums. And uh, here we've got hibiscus. I, mean, I guess I'm glad they still have hibiscus. Although, are they still getting hibiscus? Or is this just what they've been able to sell because they're way too expensive? Okay, that's enough shade. Don't need to be shady. Actually, I probably still will because I just remember the other reason I never come here is because I usually spend like 15 minutes just trying to find a cart. There's never carts here. Oh, they do have the Lady Banks climbing rose. That's a nice climbing rose. $75, but that's okay because it's Monrovia. Well, let's make it okay. I mean, it's just that's why it's expensive. And the Fort McNair chestnut. It's one of my favorites. Nice to see that at a nursery, a big box store. Still no carts, huh? Oh, that's so sad. Did you at one point hopefully have another palm tree in here that was much bigger? I've got a plastic solo cup ice bucket at home that you'd look really cute in. No, don't do it. Could do better than a majesty palm. Cart. Anywhere? Anybody, do we have carts? We just don't want people to buy things. Biting my tongue. What do we have here? Oh, never mind. I mean, it's exciting to see heliconias, but they're the ones where you gotta spend like what are they going to charge 30 40 bucks for these things probably 35 dollars because they threw some asparagus fern and a couple croton sticks in there but i'm being way too spicy it's not necessary as i get really annoyed by this no shopping cart thing found a cart i think 18 bags is good enough for now mostly just because some of them are wet and kind of heavy and i only want to put so much in the cart the old time because you know she's an old lady and three bags of pea gravel they were the only three bags I was able to find that didn't have a hole in them so that'll have to do and now it's just you know the fun part go put it in the car then take it home then get it out of the car and then go put it where it needs to go I'd show you more plant stuff here but there really isn't much else to see other I mean the crotons and those heliconias were pretty but 
everything else. It's just trees and sewages. I think there might be some daylilies and boxwoods over there, but that's about it. Okay, mulch, home. Hey, <laughs> sorry if I was being kind of spicy at loads. I think I was mostly just annoyed at Home Depot for having their gates closed. And then whenever I see heliconias at the store in late August and all those jack-o'-lanterns, I'm just like, come on, what are we doing? Putting up jack-o'-lanterns in August, that's crazy. Okay, all right, is this on? We good? All right, I uh, got the mulch spread out. Yeah, the fall stuff, that's a yearly thing. I go through it every year, I just need to get over it. I'm happy for the people who are excited about fall. You can see I have these bags very close together. That's because I'm going for an extremely heavy layer of mulch. This basket grass stuff that's come up into what's what actually is a garden bed and it's going to be a garden bed again by the time we're done with this project, sometime the next couple of weeks, it needs a heavy layer of mulch on top of it. I'd say about four inches, should be good to smother it down. I did hit it with dead brew over the weekend, but it just, you know, it, it's, it's dead brew. It, you really have to stay on top of it. I gave it two sprays and I was like, yeah, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't, and it, it didn't. That's okay because mulch, it doesn't take much to smother that stuff out. So once this is all down, that's really going to open things up. And did I bring my, got a box? Yeah, box cutter. Once these are out is what I was going to say. This is, oh, it's gonna look so good, gonna look so different. I didn't get enough to do this side yet, but that's okay, we'll get there. Right now, I'm mostly just focused on getting things done over here as it is because uh, well, everything over there, it's already done for the most part. I need to clean it up. And uh, I think I need to plant that baby grand magnolia sooner than later. But there's, I can't do a ton of landscaping over here is what I'm saying. These needle palms are already so big. And doing the things that'll stop the weeds first is generally a good idea. I'm looking forward to this being done the mulch part i was gonna wait until tomorrow just because well it's getting later in the day at this point and i don't really feel like mulching right now but i also know that i'm going to sleep very well tonight knowing that i have come through and done the thing that i hate doing <laughs> the thing that i hate doing being mulching not a big fan of it just the whole process it takes such a long time to go and buy it and kind of load onto the cart and get it home and unload it and spread it out and everything i could have it delivered which I've done before, but that just requires a different level of planning <laughs> or any planning at all. I didn't think about that until it was too late. So not having it delivered this year, uh, not for something like this. Anyways, there's a great company out here, St. Louis Composting. They have great mulch, lots of different stuff to choose from. And uh, other reason I don't have it delivered is because my HOA says you're not supposed to have stuff unloaded in the street. So it has to be dropped in the driveway. And then if it's dropped in the driveway, then I have to hand shovel it all into the gorilla carts and wheelbarrows, bring it all the way over here. And it ends up just being a lot more work than just buying the bags, bringing them over here and just cutting them open like I'm doing right now. And surprisingly, this somehow works out to be just a little bit cheaper, only by like, I think 12, 15 bucks. So it's not a lot cheaper, but it makes a difference. Especially when you're working on projects where there are gonna be lots of different expenditures and uh, just, I know somebody's gonna mention weed barrier. I'm not using weed barrier because I, I don't like weed barrier. It's fine for if you're doing gravel projects or if I were planting up a huge hedge, then I would probably want some weed barrier, but not nah, something like this. This is fine. The problem with weed barriers is that, why don't you close? This is stuck. That's really ultimately what it comes down to for me is that I just find them to be annoying when you're planting stuff up to have to slice through and cut your holes out with a box cutter in order to get the weed barrier down. Sorry, shouldn't be doing those adjustments while I'm actually talking. And it only takes a very short amount of time for debris, leaves, soil, you know, all that fun stuff to start building up on top of weed barrier. And then you just have stuff that grows right on top of it. Generally within two to three years, that's all it takes. So. What's the point? I understand the point when it comes to, like I said, if this were gravel, I would definitely want to use a weed barrier. I think that it would be a good idea because it helps hold everything in place better. But that's not what this is. It just is something else you have to spend money on. And what's the point if the weeds are just gonna grow right on top of it in a couple of years? 
is this fun for you? You want to play on the mulch? I don't know if that's a great idea, Turbo. Uh, something else I've done that is, it doesn't really matter since y'all didn't see it before is I think I'm going to bring the bed out further than I used to. So it used to be right about here was the garden bed. I think I might take it down to like the top of these bricks right here so that it comes out somewhat in front of this magnolia. I don't really need all this lawn over here. May as well expand the spot and make it a little bit bigger. Okay, set y'all down while I finished up. What do we think? I don't, don't be too judgy. I haven't straightened it out yet. I know it's lumpy. That's okay. So you just, you know, do some of this and that and that over there. It'd be better if I had a hard rake, but I don't know where it is. Looked around, couldn't find it. It's around here somewhere. The perimeter of this, I want to keep as thick as possible because that's going to be the edge where I don't want things to grow up. In the middle, I mean, proper mulching should be at least two and a half, three inches, but I'm going to be planting stuff up in here. So I'm not as concerned about that. I'm mostly just trying to get these lines back and to make sure that it is bermed up as high as possible on these edges to help suppress the lawn. Lawn, if you could see my hands, you could see I'm using quotation marks right now. <laughs> that would keep things from growing over into everything in the middle. Yeah, I'll go ahead and smooth it out and have a final look at it. Huh? Doesn't that look better? Nice and fresh. I love a nice fresh layer of mulch on everything. Things look so much better, so much more clean. And you can see the outline now, you know, what everything is supposed to look like when this is done. I tried describing it last week, but it's hard to see when you have all the lawn that was grown up inside of everything. It's gonna be hard to tell on camera because depth and dimension doesn't really come through the lens very well, but I have this mounted up at a slope with probably a good eight to 10 inches going all the way through here. That's gonna help suppress some things down. Maybe someday might do a thin wall around everything. It's not thin, a short wall, some sort of retaining brick starting from probably right around there and going around just to separate things out. But as is right now, I, I don't know, I kind of like the levels. You know, things come down here and as you go up, they come up and they slope up, plateau, and then have a gentle curve on the end. And I just like it. I think that looks good like that. So for now, that's how I'm going to keep it. This spot is officially ready for planting. I just got to get the plants. Gosh, that looks so much better, doesn't it? I know the bird bath looks more crooked than it actually is. I do need to straighten that out. Don't want to forget to do that. Uh, how much mulch is probably here? Like I said, there's about eight to 10 inches on the backside because that's where all the overgrowth is, right? And in the middle, there's probably maybe two inches. There's some spots where it's just barely covering things. There are some spots where it could use some more, but remember, it's August. So this will be getting a fall mulch here in just a few months, and I'm going to be digging in here and making all kinds of messes when the plants come in, and I start getting things going in the spot. So, I mean, this is good. I'm very happy with this. Gosh, it looks, it looks so much better, doesn't it? It'll look even better when I take it through and bring it over to this side. Right now, we kind of got a, like a black and white cookie situation with the old mulch in the new. But, yeah, this will do. So I'm not worried about all this right now. It's my main focus. It's looking good. And now, the rest of the video, I can just do fun things. Not that mulching isn't fun. The end result, lots of fun. But the process, eh, not really crazy about it. But uh, well, I guess it's going to finish that path that's down there. But otherwise, I told y'all, kind of get this space spruced up over here. And then, then hopefully hit up a nursery. Or at the very least, I need to get online and thin out my shopping cart and get the order place from Plant Delights. So you can start getting stuff in the ground, hopefully next week or I don't know, whenever I can get the plants to get here. Sooner the better. Oh boy, Toby. Big day, Toby. Are you so excited? You get to go to the vet. He loves going to the vet. He doesn't know what's going on. You're going to go in there and you're going to get to see humans. You love seeing humans. Kind of pouty. Not happy about the no food and water thing. That's okay. Wish Toby luck. So excited for you, Toby. Finally going to get that stupid light palm off yourself. Good morning, pumpkin. Dig right in. Yeah. Fresh breakfast cookies. And then someone's going to be a neurotic mess all day because the brother's going to be going. This is going to be interesting. We got some dog proofing to do, which is realize I need to put the gates up. Need to have a gate over here and over there and probably throw some rugs down. Wait, Toby's not sliding all over the place. And I'm going to have lots of nervous energy to get out today. So that's good. Probably going to be a somewhat productive day outside. Smaller, 
Time to go to a nursery. Dropped Toby off at the vet. He was very happy to be there. He loves going to the vet, so that makes me feel good that at least he's having a good time. I don't know which nursery I'm gonna go to. I think maybe Greenscape or Sugar Creek, probably Sugar Creek. Where are my lights on? What's that about? Just because I didn't turn the car on all the way? Good, okay, so sometimes the lights, all the warning lights come on. Nobody seems to know why. Talk to multiple vet, not vets, <laughs> mechanics about it. And they're just like, I don't know, old car, it does that. I placed an order with Plant Delights last night. It'll ship out Monday, so a couple days after this video comes out. And then uh, that'll take several days to get here, you know, shipping and everything. And I had to really narrow that cart down as much as possible because uh, shipping, right? It's like a hundred bucks. So I have pulled out things from the cart that were things that I thought I could probably, maybe, hopefully find at local nurseries or things that were at least similar to things that I could find at a local nursery. So that's what that's about. Here you go. You're up to date. Heading to the nursery and gonna put the camera down because I'm not looking at it, so <laughs> this may not even be usable. All right, music's really loud. I'm at Greenscapes. I don't know much of a show with the music in the background, so it's really loud. Oh, ginger, gotta get a ginger. Begonias, good, these were on the list. And I took them off from Plant Delights. I don't know what kind they are, just say Grandis. That's a cute hosta, water slide. I like that, that's similar to one that I was gonna order and I took off the list because I was hoping I'd be able to find it at a nursery. That is tempting. I think the Sesquianas, Sesquana camellias are more cold hardy. Technically zone seven, but I don't know. I think it would be risky. What kind of pomegranate is this? The wonderful pomegranate, huh? Lots of annuals, zinnias, and all those things. Just a few things here as far as shade plants are concerned, so I'm probably going to avoid the temptation to get things that are not necessary, like annuals, and head over to, uh, what's it called, Sugar Creek. So they're not too far from here, and it's nice to diversify the options and see what they have. So I need little things. Big plants, we've talked about this, it's going to be really hard to dig holes for big plants, so I, know I need to really want them in order to get them and plant them up. Oh, look at the pineapples. Those are fun. Sorry about the background noise. First it was music, now it's highway. Oh my gosh, these are so stinking cute. The little baby Aranidias with their little chonk trunks. Is that, wait. They're not, they're not that cute. Those are $49.99 cute, not 200 no. Tons of Crotons, $19.99. Great price, they're huge. Cheaper than the ones that was in Home Depot and they look a lot better too. Toby's out of surgery. I, I know, I know, I know. Just let it go, don't worry about it. Look at what else happened. That's from Greenscape, I didn't mean to. I blacked out. Next thing I know, I was loading a like seven foot tall ponytail palm into the car. I'm at Sugar Creek. Time to get more plants. They say it's very encouraging that that surgery went so quickly. They were saying two hours, that wasn't even close to two hours. It was like an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. Oh, they've redone all their entryway planters with fall things. I don't mind it. They look pretty. See? Isn't that fun? When you come here, you got this nice entryway you can get through. Okay, come on. Come on, wagon. It's fun. Very inviting. like the color combos here. Oh, what's the size of this caladium? That's one big happy plant. Oh, it's in a planter, that's why. I was gonna say, it's pretty intense if it were one of these little, you know, proven winners ones. Oh, they're remodeling, putting up a new greenhouse. Okay, so that means there's not as much to look at as far as houseplants go, but that's okay. Look at the little Gloriosums. These are stinking cute. Don't need them. 45 bucks. That's a great deal. Oh, how much are you guys? That's not terrible. Just the regular lady wears? That's a nice looking one. Big fat leaf on that. Good option for the shade garden. Oh, they've got the bat flowers. Those are fun. Not gonna mess with them though. They can be finicky. Kind of high maintenance sometimes. 
No way. Look at these tiny little Schaeffler Taiwanians. Taiwaniana. That's pretty cool. So these are really cold hardy Schaeffler's. If you're in zone 7, these are worth giving a try. And 25 bucks is a good deal. I've only ever seen these sold from, I think, Monrovia. They have one that's called, like, Rising Phoenix. Something like that. Those are pretty pricey. In fact, I might get one of these. Sorry about all the whispering. I know it bothers some people, but it's just awkward being out filming in public. 90 for the ties. It's not terrible. Look at all these Oncidiums. I never see Oncidiums at the nurseries. Are they labeled? Do we know what kind they are? I live in a land of Phalaenopsis. That's all anybody ever sells. And some Dendrobiums in here too. None of them are labeled. I'm not gonna. Well, there's one that's labeled back there. No, it just says Orchids Miscellaneous. Never mind. No, there's a Pacific Passage. It's one of the worst scenarios. Those are neat. Now what we're here for, focus on the shade plants. Oh, it's so tempting though. I'm also just realizing that the spot right here that's under construction is the spot where the shade plants used to be. So, I don't know, the selection might not be quite what I was hoping for. Hey. Oops. they are neat planters. It's a neat color motif. I really like that. It's cool. Dancing with Dragon's Hosta. 18 inches high, close to what I'm looking for, but still a little small. Hmm. Nice stripes on those. Lily of the Valley. I love those. Some Pachysandra. Those usually do okay with part shade, and I like the variegation on this one. Oh, that wasn't too close. You see it? Very pretty. These are beautiful. Love these. The Coronioto. Don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it's a Japanese maple. I think these only go about 10, there should be a thing right here, 10 feet, 6 to 10 feet tall and wide. They have an open habit and very thin, delicate, lacy leaves on them. It's a beautiful, beautiful tree when they mature. These are cool. Hadn't seen these in person before. Desert orchid shrub, a hybrid of two incredible North American natives, desert willow and catalpa, result in lovely flowers that look like both orchids and snapdragons, but are way easier to care for. You'll get to enjoy these sweetly scented blooms starting in late spring or early summer, and then sporadically throughout the season. Hardy zone 6, 6 8 feet tall, 4 6 feet wide, sun to part sun. And there's the flower, isn't it pretty? These are nice sized plants, they're only 45 bucks. You get sporadic blooms throughout the summer. And they're very pretty blooms, too. I've read about this one. I hadn't seen it in person. I kind of thought they'd look weedy, but they don't. Oh, in fact, look. This one's even got some flowers on them. They're almost spent flowers, but they're still there. So they're not lying. Blooming in the spring and throughout the season. I might have to get some of these. Pawpaw tree! Sorry, another nursery that's right by a really busy road. I love pawpaws. I should... I need a bigger yard. I would love to plant some pawpaws. They're such beautiful trees. The native, and they have horn beams. Oh, I don't see Calacanthus at the nurseries out here that often. I have always wanted to grow them, but never see them for sale. I don't know where I would put it though. What would I do with you? They get really neat seed pods on them. I don't see any on these. There's the flowers. Extremely fragrant. It even says seed pods persist until frost. And the flowers smell really good, and the price isn't bad either. These are really big. That's not really a shade plant. I mean, it could go part shade. I'd have to find some place to put it. And I already got to find some place to put this guy. <laughs> but this is, I'm, uh, I don't know what to do. Oh, and they have the fringe tree. They have a very good selection of things that I never see for sale out here. Fringe trees. Great. They don't get too big. They have a nice vase shape to them. Lots of flowers on them. And the foliage. Isn't it beautiful? It's so pretty. It's a nice, dark, glossy. It looks like an evergreen. But, but it's not. Okay, it's too loud here. I think I've done enough damage. I'm going to poke around a little bit more. But let's say that's probably about it for now. <laughs> Go home and have a gander at the things that I maybe should or should not have gotten. You've <laughs> got some good stuff here. Gorilla cart's full. I'd say overflow. I guess it is overflowing because I have the plants stacked up high. You all saw some of these while I was at the nursery. The ginger right here. I remember this from a video when I was at Sugar Creek in the springtime. And uh, I didn't get it. And some people commented saying, why didn't you get it? Because it's just such nice. I'm trying to find good lighting here. 
Yeah, that's good enough. Because it was such a nice, lovely, full plant that could use some water. It's kind of thirsty. The price is pretty good. And uh, I didn't get it. And that was because I didn't have a spot ready for it. But I do now. So this is the wild ginger. Eserum splendens is the name there. These are hardy all the way to zone 5. These are great in the shade to part shade. They're a slow spreader. There are a lot of different types to choose from. Is it a mealybug? I think it's just Lent. The Aserums. Tons of different leaf forms to choose from. This is just a pretty basic one. It has some nice variegation on it, but there are some that have some pretty wild and crazy looking leaves on them, and I would like to give those a try sometime in the future. But for now, I just wanted to go ahead and pick one up from the local nursery and get it planted, see how it does and how it comes back and everything next year, and then can move on to more fancy, more expensive types. This is a really nice one, though. Very full. Very thirsty, too. I mean, extremely full. This is a very nice-sized plant. So the more fancy varieties that are out there with the really crazy leaf forms on them, usually they say smaller, so that's one thing. I have been trying to... I'm just I'm going in all different directions here. While I've been trying to find the right ginger, pick one out that I really like, I have been having a difficult time finding one that has a leaf that I really like with a height that I really like because a lot of the ones that I'm finding that have a really pretty leaf on them also only get like three inches. This one right here is a six to ten inch, so it's a much more large, robust plant in comparison. And I think this one... What, does it have a picture of the flower? Yeah, okay, so they do have flowers on them too. It's not like you expect with a tropical type ginger. They hold these very close to the ground. So it's not like something you're typically really going to see unless you're looking for it. It's the kind of flower that if you're not looking for it, you might miss it, but you get the point. It's really cool. And they have different flowers on them too. So not only different leaf forms, but different flower forms. And that's fine. What's not to love about that? Love variety. Hey, baby. Hi, you're wet and it's cold. Please don't get me wet. Please don't get me wet, Turbo. Oh, this is fun. Flower pot. I was really hoping to find a couple of pots that I would really like for these agaves here. And I didn't, but I found this one. I'm not going to put the agaves in it. I just I really like it. It'd be pretty with... I don't, I don't, I don't even know what I'm going to do with it. It was an impulse buy. I probably shouldn't have gotten that. Some sort of bonsai will go in there. Something that comes up and flows out. That's what that kind of pot is meant for. That's what you're meant to do with that sort of pot with bonsai. Down here, this is a fun plant. It's a great price too. Got a good deal on this. So I was going to order one of these and then I said, you know, you know, sometimes I find these and they come in with the assorted tropicals at the nursery. So I held off on it. So of spending, you know, 25, 30 bucks for something in a six inch container. Just picked one up for like 19 bucks from the local nursery. For food, you, you don't you, you leave it alone. You leave it alone. That's not for you. What are you doing? It's okay. You're a good boy. He's pouting because I haven't thrown his toy for him. Farfugium japonicum. Really cool plants. They have, I mean, there's not much else to say. They have really big glossy green leaves. Typically regarded as a zone 7B and up. They do like a well-drained, organically rich soil that stays consistently moist. I don't know how well it'll end up doing in the shade garden, but I'm going to give it a try. This is not zone 7B, but I have a lot of mulch. <laughs> I do a lot of mulching. We'll just see what happens. I did a video on these a long time ago, and the comment section was just full of people telling me that they're cold hardy to like zone 4 and zone 3, which I just, I'm sorry, I don't believe it. I do not think that that's true at all. Uh, but I'm going to give it a try and see what happens. They're oftentimes confused with Ligularias. In fact, the entire taxonomy on these and the naming is all over the place. I need to pull something up so I can give you something more direct. Let me see if I can find an article or something that describes it better than anything I'm going to be able to give you. So basically what it comes down to is that for some reason the Farfugium japonicum is also sometimes referred to as a type of Ligularia like the Tutsula forma, I don't know. I can't remember the name of it. Ligularia, much more cold tolerant, cold loving even. Farfugiums, not so much. So that's, I think, where that confusion comes from. It will maybe do great over there, or maybe it'll die. I don't know. I will perhaps hold on to this throughout the wintertime in the growth space and get it started in the spring in the shade garden. I think that that would be better so it has more time to root itself out 
and really establish itself before having to experience a winter, right? It might be a good idea. And all that aside, they're just really lovely plants. This one's even still small. So these will go about 30 to 36 inches high in these leaves. They're kind of dusty right now, but they're normally nice and glossy. They'll get not quite double this size. They hold themselves nice and high, stiff growth, and they have really neat flower stalks that come up high on them. Just a fun, exotic looking plant. And there are tons of different varieties to choose from. There's one that's become very popular that's called like Firefly, something like that. And that's the new name of it. It's one that's been around forever. I think it used to be called Leopard and it's been renamed and now it's really popular and you can't find it for sale anywhere even though you used to be able to get them all over the place for like 12 bucks. But that's the same plant. They just have lots of speckles on them. There are some that have more ruffled edges and they are very similar to Ligularia in appearance. And as far as a lot of their growing conditions are concerned too, it's just the Farfugium japonicum, the Gigantium one, this one right here, tends to be more heat tolerant than a lot of the Ligularias, but not as cold tolerant. And in my experience, a lot of Ligularias can take a good bit more sun than the Farfugiums can. But I think a lot of that just goes back to your climate. Now they're being watered and where you live and humidity, all that fun stuff. Okay, what else is over here? Hardy begonia. So, talked about this briefly at the nursery. Sorry that my time at Greenscape was so short, by the way. It's the, it's not the music was loud. The speaker was right by the shade plants. And uh, there just wasn't a ton there that I thought I would be getting because I was really looking for smaller plants and they were a little low on stock at the time. They'll be filling back up here fairly soon, but that's why I was in and out of there fairly fast. So the begonia though, started to talk about this at the nursery. In my shopping cart from Plant Delights, I did have some of the begonia grandis. That's what this is. Those were the hardy begonias, or a type of hardy begonia. That's called the Heron's Pirouette, and that is a beautiful, very open, kind of ethereal looking begonia. Very similar to what you're seeing right here. I don't think the Heron's Pirouette has quite as much reddish on the underside. They get bigger though, like three feet. This one right here, they're saying 24 inches. Pink flowers, they're saying they're fragrant. I've never noticed fragrance on my hardy begonias, but I've also never like bent down and sniffed them either. So maybe they do smell nice. I don't know. The, this should be good over there. They are drought tolerant, but they will still do better in a moist, semi-moist environment. Rich, well-drained soil, all that fun stuff. I think they even say on the tag, this is great for edging or mixed border shade or woodland gardens. I get more of a tropical plant vibe from them because, I mean, look at those leaves. There are tons of, well, not tons, there are several, I should say, different forms of hardy begonias. Some are good into zone five. I think the Heron's Pirouet is good into zone five. This is probably listed as a zone six. I don't know. It doesn't say. So this is from Ritter's, which is a local grower. And one thing I really like about getting plants that are grown by Ritter's is, well, you'd know that what they're growing is stuff that's already going to do well for you because they're growing specifically for the area. Yeah, typically zone five to six with the hardy begonias. And there, like I said, there are some phones to choose from. Plant Delights has one that I really love called Smooch that doesn't have as much of an abundance when it comes to the flowers, but they have a very glossy foliage that is much more tropical looking and just lush. It's a very pretty plant. I decided to pull the fun begonias out of my Plant Delights shopping cart because it's later in the year and that's something I would rather plant in the springtime. And they, you know, they're pricey because they're special varieties, special cultivars, ones that they've come up with on their own and some other fun, unique ones. So I figured I'd just get one of the regular ones and see how that does and can move forward next spring. The spurge. Love a good spurge. <laughs> uh, it's just a good ground cover. I like the creamy white edges on this one. I would like to try several different types of ground covers over in that area. Yeah, Pachysandra terminalis silver edge. It's a really nice full plant. One thing I love about Pachysandra is once you plant it and get it established, you keep it in the ground for a year and get it growing, that's a plant you'll have for a long time. They're very, very, very vigorous. Sometimes too much, but they're really easy to pull when they get into areas that you don't want them to be in. And I just like the shape and the lushness of them. They are 
semi evergreen to evergreen here where I live. I have pachysandra all over the place around my driveway and parts of my front yard that's been there for as long as I can remember. It's always been very sturdy, low maintenance, don't need to do much with it. The variegation on this is something that I'm going to have to be mindful of if I want to keep those nice white edges. I don't want this to be in the deep, deep shade. And Pachysandra doesn't really want to be in the deep shade anyways. It, this is, could go full sun to part sun, part shade because of the variegation. Uh, they say part sun on here. And yet four to eight. That's a really nice cold tolerant plant. These are succulents. You get it. Fun plant. Going to be a good ground cover that's going to fill out much more quickly than that ginger. Just make a nice patch in a very short amount of time. I love those leaves. The Schefflera Taiwaniana. Did I call this Taiwanensis at the nursery? If, if I did, I was wrong. Awesome cold hardy plant. 7 to 9, really 7B and up. These are very prone to foliar burn with the drying winter winds and root rot if the ground's freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing. So a good amount of mulch, not directly up to the stem, but a nice ring around it in a protected site, partial sun, and they should do fine for you. I would wrap them up below like 20 to 15 degrees if there's going to be any precipitation on top of them. Look at those leaves. It's just, it's a Cheflora, but cold hardy. Smaller than your typical houseplant type Cheflora. I think these go like six to 10 feet, something like that. Where's the, ten? let's try and get that to bend over here. See if we can't read that. Oh, eight to 12 feet, six feet wide. So, okay, that's a decent size. Still not as big as some of the houseplant types can get, depending on which ones you're growing. But a nice, very tropical looking plant to have outside. Great container option for things that you move around. So I've talked about that before, about how I like to have various yuccas and the mule palms, windmill palms, and things that are containerized that I can leave outside for most of the year. But I need to move them in when it gets to be below like 15, 20 degrees. That's going to be the case with this one for a few years. I'm not going to put this in the ground until I get a good amount of growth, more so girth on the stem here. Want to have something that can handle those cold snaps when we have them. But I was really excited about this. These are not normally something I can find at the nurseries. I said the thing about the, I just noticed that there's a frog stamped on there. That's a nice touch. ADD, you're welcome. The Rising Phoenix is the one that Monrovia carries. And I think there are some other ones. I don't even know if that's the right name, but there's the full name on this one, Shaflora Taiwaniana. $24.99 is not bad for something that is typically sold for like 50 to 90 bucks. A little small, but honestly, it's not that much smaller than the Rising Phoenix, which I had a few years ago, and that was like a $90 plant. It was Monrovia. And the nursery that I got it from just tends to be more of a pricey nursery. That one died last summer when we had a heat spell that was just, it was unbelievably hot. It was the heat spell, if you remember, that like cracked the patio all the way down from one end to the other. It was like 108, 109 degrees and something along those lines for multiple days. And it rotted it out. It did not like the extreme shifts up and down and up and down where it would be, you know, in the hundreds and then drop into the eighties and then back into the hundreds. It just, it wasn't a fan. So this one, I am going to be more mindful of making sure it stays in the shade. And that is, it is in a potting mix that drains very freely, but still holds on to some moisture. The potting mix that had the other one in, I think held on to too much moisture. And th that was an issue with the swinging temperatures and everything. It just rotted the poor thing out. So hopefully I'll have better luck with this one. Toad Lily, look at those leaves. And just the growth habit. I love the growth habit on the Toad Lilies. It does remind me of the Zingibers, the Zingiber Myoga gingers. This one's called Gilt Edge, the Tricertus Formosana, height 18 to 24 inches, 24 inches spaced out. These will spread a good amount, so maybe bigger than that. These bloom late summer into early fall which is really nice. You get some flowers out of them at a time of year when a lot of other things are not in flower. And this one is supposed to be more vigorous than some other toad lilies. I believe it said something about that on here. That's just a description. Selected for superior vigor and aptly named for the attractive gold margins. Okay, blah, 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 blah. blah. Anything else important? Uh, bright light as opposed to full sun. That's what they recommend. I also find that interesting because down here under care, it's Kind of hard to read it. Well drained soil in part to full shade. On the front of the tag it says full sun to part shade. 
Toad lilies, bright filtered light, maybe direct sun in the mornings, usually fine. If you live in a more mild climate, then you can get away with more light with them. They like things organically rich and well-drained and consistently moist, but I, they can be fairly drought tolerant once they're established. They make a nice spread. They spread fairly well and they just have these fun upright growths and the flowers, I should have, that's kind of an important thing. The flowers are interesting. I don't know how you're gonna be able to see it there in that picture, but they have really, really pretty flowers. And well, you'll get to see them hopefully here in a few weeks when this one starts to bloom. That's gonna fill out and make a nice patch in the garden. The really beautiful, I just, I love the variegation. Isn't that beautiful? It's a nice variegation. It reminds me of a tall spindly hosta. Oh, tall and spindly is a descriptor we want to use when we're saying something looks really good, but I think it's beautiful. Hakenakloa, lemon zest. This is a fun variety. So the Hakenakloas, which is a Japanese forest grass, Hakenakloa macro, I believe it's the only plant in its genus. These are a very nice, small, ornamental grass that's great for shade gardens. It's a nice plant. There aren't a lot of grasses, ornamental grasses, that do well in the shade. These do wonderfully, provided they have the right conditions. So here in St. Louis, if they get too much sun and too much moisture, you have to route rot and leaf scorch. And you can see that this is starting to get some scorch on them. It's pretty typical when I see these in most gardens, they have a good amount of scorch on them from getting too much sun. I think the spot over here in the shade garden, I've got some good locations for it. It should do well over there. They have a somewhat mounding habit. They come up and just sort of blow in the wind, it's kind of ethereal, like I was saying about the Begonia grandis. Uh, here's the dimensions, 12 inch height, 24 inch spread, might go a little bit taller than 12 inches, part sun to shade. The sun dappled light is best, direct sun in the morning, probably okay. Where I live, that needs to be cut off by like 10.30 to 11.30 in the morning, it's when the sun starts to get really intense, then dappled light throughout the rest of the day or shade throughout the rest of the day. There are people who just say that these are renowned for being a low fuss, low maintenance type of grass. I disagree. I think that in comparison to the majority of ornamental grasses, these do require making sure that they are sited in the proper spot. And as long as they're situated properly, very low fuss, low maintenance. It's just a typical ornamental grass. Want to keep it watered deeply so it stays nice and established, gets those roots down nice and deep and give it a cut back in the fall or late winter and let it flush out with new growth. That's all there is to it. The lemon zest is one that just has really high amounts of variegation. So the most common type of Japanese forest grass that we see around is usually the areola. <laughs> Areo Did I say areola? No, that's the name, right? Areola. I'm pretty sure that it's just the gold. It's a gold variegated Japanese forest grass. And there are a lot of different variegated types that you can get. The lemon zest is a higher variegation that... Uh, <laughs> They say it has more yellow in it, but whenever I've seen them, I notice a lot more white than anything. But I can get that there's a hint of yellow. It's not as gold as the areola one. Am I saying that? What if I'm just saying areola and I don't? I'm pretty sure that that's the name for the other one. The really common one. It's gold, and it's a beautiful grass. Uh, also, the less variegation, or no variegation, then the more sun you could probably give them. These look beautiful if you have an area where there's a slope in the garden, you have several of them planted up because they, they had that nice mound to them. It just, it looks like something you'd want to dive into and roll around, which you shouldn't do because they will snap and break. So I wouldn't do that, but it just looks so plush and lush. The really beautiful plants. This one's pretty small. It was the biggest one they had. The lemon zest is one I've wanted to try for a while, but I've never seen it for sale. And I'm looking forward to watching this one grow. I like how these look also, not just on a slope in the garden, but near rocks and boulders or around other types of structures, like maybe a bird bath or a fountain, something of the sort, maybe a lantern, lighting, whatever you got. They just, they look really good up against other things. I can't wait to get that planted. I wanted to get three of them, but it was like 22 bucks. Let's just get this one first and see how it does. Pineapple Willy, Safari Adventure. This is one I've wanted to grow for a long time, but I'd never seen it in person. I went ahead and I nabbed it up. It's a full sun, so this isn't for the shade garden. This is, okay, it was an impulse buy. That's fine. It's okay. It's a really neat eucamus. If you don't know some background on the pineapple lilies, they have what looks like a bromeliad type of growth on them. And if in fluorescence, it looks like that of a pineapple. I mean, that's why they call them pineapple lilies. They look more like a pineapple before they start to bud out and bloom. 
see, it's just a nice long bloom stalk with lots of little pink flowers on them. I've been growing the Eucamus Sparkling Burgundy for, I don't even know, a very, very, very long time, probably 15, 20 years. It's one of my favorites of the Pineapple Lilies. One, because it's more cold hardy. A lot of the Eucamus, the Pineapple Lilies, are generally hardy zone seven and up, and there are several and growing number of forms that they're saying are good into zone six. You can probably try them in zone five B too. You want to plant them at least six inches down if you're getting them from a bulb and mulch them heavily in the winter if you are north of zone six. They come in all different shapes, not shapes, they come in all different sizes. There are some variations in shape as far as how upright they are. There used to be one that I think it was called like octopus or something like that. I think it was from Brian's Botanicals that was pretty flat and neat looking, only got a few inches tall. But for the most part, you get this nice vase shape to them and they're generally either red or green. The Safari Adventure is red and green. So look down on the inside of that. Look at all that color. Oh, oh it's so much more colorful in person. <laughs> Just gonna have to take my word for it. It has a heavy burgundy kind of reddish hue to the foliage with a green stripe in the middle. And that is supposed to age out over time. So you can see the lower, older foliage has some more green on it. So you get lots of color. And that's something that I just love. Look at that stripe right there. Isn't that beautiful? I love that. And it is, it's kind of funky. They don't transport very well. They're very snappy plants. So it's something you gotta be really careful with when you're moving them around. I think this one said it goes two and a half to three feet tall. Yeah, two and a half to three feet tall. So that's a good size. Some of them stay smaller. I like the nice big ones. And you can see the picture right here. You get a nice established clump in full sun. Just a gorgeous plant. I won't go on about it too much because it's not for the shade garden. And it is kind of late in the year to be planting this, but I think it should be fine. Just have to make sure I put some extra mulch on it. The real trick is going to be finding a spot that gets enough sun for it. I probably, I shouldn't have gotten this plant. I don't know where I'm gonna put it because they do need a good amount of sun or else they have a floppy open habit. Like all this is gonna be more stretched out like this and the bloom stalks just flop over and look terrible if they don't have enough light. So. Uh, I don't know. I'll figure something out. May end up in a planter in the front yard where there's some more sun. All right, now the big stuff. We've got some fun stuff in here. Calicanthus. Calicanthus, Florida. Carolina Allspice. There's no attractive tag to start that one off with. Excellent shrubs. Not ones that I have seen for sale in the area in many, many, many years. And when I have, they're in very small containers. I have done work in people's gardens who have some very old Calicanthus and I have always wanted one. I think that they are beautiful plants, just not something I ever thought I could find at a big size. I have tried getting them in little pots before, and they just didn't make it through the winters when I was getting them as really small little plants. This nice big one, this thing should soar through winter, no problem. These are a nice size shrub. I think they should be like six to 10 feet at the absolute maximum, especially this far north. High and wide, they're gonna be more like somewhat vase-shaped on them. And they are great for part sun to part shade. These at the nursery were getting way too much sun and it looks like they probably have some chlorosis. So they could use some TLC. Typically they have a very nice, glossy, shiny, deep green leaf on them. And in the springtime, they have beautiful red flowers on them that have an extreme spicy, sweet scent to them. Those flowers, fall off and then they give way to little seed pods, the Carolina allspice, right? And those seed pods are supposed to hold on for the majority of the year. So I'm sure storms and things will knock them off, but they're great for wildlife. Birds like to peck the seeds out of them. I believe there's some kind of medicinal use for the bark. I don't know. I'm not going to get into all that. Overall, it's just a shrub I've always wanted to try. I don't know about it in the shade garden over there because if it's a very fragrant plant, I'm going to want it more over here. So it's probably going to go up here on the hill garden in place of a hydrangea that hasn't done anything for me in years. And I think this will go in its spot. It's going to be something taller. It'll add some more privacy, but not be so big that it blocks out too terribly much. Just a nice attractive shrub with fun flowers and they smell great there really isn't a ton else to say about it they're pretty easy to grow uh drought tolerant once established and uh, just a fun shrub for the part shade maybe even shade the more hot your climate the more shade they can take and they're native to a lot of the u.s the southeastern u.s i think virginia down to florida something like that i don't know for sure i can't remember such a nice sized plant Really good sized shrub. That's why I got it too. It can be hard to find nice sized shrubs, especially these days that don't break the bank, right? I mean, 
it's so expensive getting good sized plants these days. And this thing, it's a nice big bush. It was like, I think it was $55, which I mean, back in the day I would have said, that's outrageous, but that's a pretty good deal for a shrub this size, especially a calicanthus when it's something that I can never find for sale, at least not in a nice size. Yeah, and that's actually, that's why I got the next shrub. Catalpa, y'all already know about this one. I went on about this one at the nursery, read the description off for you at the nursery, the El Nino Desert Orchid. It's a six to nine, five to eight feet tall and four to six feet wide. It's a very easy part to full sun shrub. So this is not going to go in the shade garden either. I have a spot back here in the garden where I would like to put this. What's great about these is that they have really nice long sprays of very exotic tropical looking flowers. The plumes remind me of like a giant angelonia, as you can say, or some sort of snapdragon. Purpley with a nice white throat, a little bit of yellow in there, purpley pink. And the selling point to me is, well, one, catalpa in general, just really easy to grow shrubs, pretty sturdy, and they have pretty flowers on them. This one is supposed to bloom. We talked about all this at the nursery, right? It's supposed to bloom sporadically throughout the summertime. So you get a show of flowers in the spring, I think late spring, I believe is when this starts to flower and then sporadically throughout the rest of the growing season. That was, that's the selling point for me. And it was only like 40 bucks, $45. This thing's huge. It's twiggy, but it's huge for 45 bucks. Okay. I almost got two of them, but I decided that that would be stupid. I didn't need to do that because I only have space for the one that's going to be in the background over here. It'll be nice in the springtime. All these tropicals aren't out here. So be able to see the nice sprays of pink and purple flowers back there in the garden and they're low maintenance too. That's just great because this area over here behind the coconut palm and the croton, there's some lawn over there and it's difficult to keep that area irrigated and it's hard to find shrubs that will do well. The catalpa should do really well and it's a nice size because the yard over there is not that big and I've wanted to put something over there that would flower. It'd be really pretty to be able to see back behind everything but not be so big that it's gonna to start to hang over the fence or make a mess in the neighbor's yard. I think this is a good candidate for that. And it's such a nice size. It's going to be easy to plant too because it's a huge plant in a tiny pot, which isn't something that as gardeners we should be excited about, but I'm excited about it because I'm not going to have to dig a very big hole. This is going to take like two minutes to plant this thing up. That's another bonus. Impulse buy. Not really. Kind of, but not so much. So this is a ponytail palm, an extremely large ponytail palm. Kind of scrawny. But that's okay, not gonna girth shame. Greenscape hit, got, I think, two of these in in the springtime, maybe three, I don't remember for sure. But every single time I go there, I have been looking at them thinking, oh, I really want it, but then I don't get it because I'm getting a lot of other annuals or other things. And they had the one left and I was like, just get it. Just go ahead and get it. It's such a nice sized plant. This is probably a good seven and a half feet tall, say six and a half foot. You take it out of the pot. I've wanted to get a very low maintenance, low water needing plant to put in one of the rooms in the house. I've been doing a lot of construction and remodeling. It's been on pause for the last several months, but it's gonna be picking back up here soon. And uh, this is perfect. I've wanted to get a ponytail palm for the space in the house. Y'all will see when all this stuff's done uh, in the house. We'll do a little tour of the remodel that went on in there. And this is, it's perfect. This is a perfect plant. Ponytail palm. Nice size on it. It's going to need a repot. I mean, it's a ponytail palm. It'll be fine in this container for basically forever. Not really forever, but you know what I mean. But uh, for ease of maintenance, I would like to bump it up to a larger container. And also it'll make it more sturdy so it doesn't flop around. Really nice big plant. On that note, I was saying earlier about large shrubs being very expensive. So tropicals and houseplants, as we all know, very expensive. And I got a great price on this. It's a freaking beast. And this is something that should be around for, is, uh, not forever, but my lifetime for sure. As long as, you know, the being extenuating circumstances could happen. But obviously those are things we don't plan on. But if it's just in the house where it's going to get bright morning light, maybe some filtered afternoon light. There's a tree outside the window where some light will come through. And you just splash some water on it every now and then. Great, easy, low maintenance, low fuss house plant. And it's tall enough that I don't have to worry about the cats. So that's been the other issue with ponytail palms and a lot of dracaenas is that until they get a certain amount of trunk on them, I don't want them in the house because the cats can jump up in the pots and munch on the ends of the leaves here because, you know, this right here. The cats just love it. They love to chew on these things. If I come in and pull out 
probably the bottom six inches of foliage from here. And that should take care of most of the stuff that's hanging down low enough for the cats to get to. It's already too high for Pumpkin to get to, but the kitten, she could get in there. She's tall. She could make it happen. It's just everything added up. And I was like, yeah, go ahead and get it. You've been looking at it. They've got one left. I'll get a... Well, actually, I don't know if I'll bump it up into a nice pot. I'll probably put it in a basket. I'll pot it up into a nice nursery container and put a basket around it and get it in the house. I'm really excited about this one. Just fun. Especially with ponytail palms, because it's a plant that you know that you're going to have for a really long time. So it's really exciting to get them because of that, because you know that they're going to be around for a long time. My last ponytail palm I had for, I don't even know, 15, 20 years, something like that. It took a hard frost and died. This one's going to be staying in the house, so that's not something that I'm going to have to worry about. The other one, it was a very unexpected freeze, and it killed it. And I've missed it ever since then, so now I've got a new one. So not as girthy as my old one, but that's all right. Like I said, we're not going to girth shame. It's got a nice trunk on it, and the foliage is nice and healthy, so it's going to look nice in the house. It's going to look really nice in the house. I can't wait to get that moved inside. Okay, that was fun. Lots of fun new stuff over here. Not planting up the shade stuff yet because I just I want to wait for the stuff from Plant Delights to come in the mail and have a good time setting them out and playing around with arrangements. I haven't sketched anything out for the most part over there. I just have an idea of what I want to do. I played around some stuff on Photoshop, so I guess that's the equivalent of sketching stuff out, but you get it. I'm not ready yet. I want the rest of the stuff to get here. Right now, the last thing I need to do is get this fixed up. I don't like the way this looks anymore. In general, I haven't really been liking this spot, and then especially once the green wall went up, I said, eh, I gotta make some changes, because from far away, everything just blends into this backdrop, and you can't even see it, so I'm just gonna change some things out. I'm gonna move the lanterns around. I have other spots where I think that these would look nice. I do kind of have to breeze through this, too. What I didn't mention when I started talking about the plants is that it's the next day from the nursery, so I went and Got Toby from the vet's office, and he slept most of the day, and then woke up in the middle of the night and barked and needed care all night long. He's recovering well, though. He's able to get up now, move around. Last night, he couldn't do that, so he was completely dependent on humans to be able to get around and go outside and go potty and everything. It was a big surgery. The mass they removed, I don't want to call it a mass, it was a lipoma. It was over six pounds. And before I had people going, why did you wait so long? I didn't. I wanted to have it removed. Talked to multiple vets. He had a heart murmur. He would have bad EKGs. And then last month, took him in because uh, he, I wanted to start him on uh, Labrella, which is an arthritis medication. Really great. Dogs respond very well to it. And then brought up, you know, the lipoma and was like, can we check this out? Like, come on, this thing's huge. He's old, it's not easy to get around with something like that on you, and it's getting to the point where I was worried about it rupturing. So uh, we've fallen to this point of them saying, well, the surgery could be risky because of a heart murmur and the bad EKGs, the anesthesia could kill him. And then me having to be like, okay, but if we don't remove this, it's possibly going to rupture and then have to put him down in a very tragic last minute, like, you know, unexpected, just horrific way. I, I don't want Toby to have to go through that. So the options are, we just keep saying no, not going to do the surgery, and then have to put him down in a very just inhumane condition, right? Inhumane conditions is what I would call that. It's not right to just leave that thing on him. Or he passes away while I'm under anesthesia. That's how I would want him to go compared to leaving that thing on him. So they uh, did the EKG again, and it was good. His heart murmur is gone. His heart sounded great. He's, I don't know, his heart's Benjamin Buttoning. I don't know what that's about. And that's what had the vet go, okay, we're going to call in our special surgeons and get this thing off of him, and it's off of him. Surgery went well, went very smoothly. It was fast. The thing, they held on to it and showed it to me. I'm not going to put it up here on the screen, but um, it, it was intense. These large lipomas are not uncommon on dogs, especially like Cocker Spaniels. They get them a lot. They're down in their groin area, and it's not really that big of a deal to remove them. Recovery can take a while. His recovery is going to take some time, but it's something that a lot of vets do. It was just his age mixed in with his enlarged heart and the murmur that I couldn't find a vet that was comfortable. There were multiple vets consulted over the years and consensus with everybody was 
That probably wasn't a good idea that they were like, oh, dogs got lipomas, it's not that big of a deal. But then it got huge and his heart murmur and all that bad stuff went away, so now he's good again. So there's the Toby update. He's inside sleeping, finally. He was pretty fussy last night. He's got his pain management and everything to keep him comfortable. Lots of drains in his belly. This is going to make him feel so, so, so much better. But this was supposed to be set, okay, it's just folded in half. I was gonna say, there's no way. There's no way that they, you call that six feet. That's not very wide. That's not really gonna do the trick, but I suppose it's better than just looking at the top of this thing that's all stained up and everything. I think we're gonna have to find another one. It's just a linen table runner, but I clearly need more. But this is, like I said, it's better than nothing. And try and get it ruffled up and crimpled. That's kind of the vibe I'm going for here. I picked up a new lantern that I think is going to stand out better than the black ones that are over there. When I ordered this lantern, I didn't realize that the candle was built into it. I thought it was just there in the picture. So that's, I don't know. I don't know what to do about that. But I wanted to fill the thing with lemons. I guess that that's just going to add for extra filler. The plan was to either fill it up all the way with lemons, if I have enough lemons, and if not, then to fill it up to like right here and put candles on top of it or maybe some twigs or something, or just get more lemons and limes and fill it up from there. I think it'll make for a very nice pop of color. Oh yeah, wouldn't that be beautiful if it were filled up all the way? That's not going to cut it though. Not enough. Oh uh, no, that's so cute. I like the way that looks. I could, I guess I'll put batteries in that candle and let it shine through. Actually, I think that's a bad idea. I think that would look stupid. That should stand out much better back here than the other. Oh yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's not quite enough, but I could add some more filler. I could add some more lemons, uh, or I could take some out and put some small candles on top of the lemons and the limes. Yeah, there's options. I don't know if I like these. They looked cool. Now I have them going, eh, I don't know. It may not be my thing. There are some that I like better that look like a white pineapple with I think either a gold or a black top. I might end up swapping those out and doing those over here instead. <sighs> this spot right here, I have some vases inside that might look good here, but they're kind of nice and I don't really want to keep them outside. Let's see. Went inside and grabbed them. Figured may as well bring them out and have a look. Those are really pretty. I think when I get the other linen, over here that that will look a lot better. I don't know. I don't know. I'm apprehensive about keeping these outside because they were, they were kind of pricey. But I think they look nice. I don't really think they go with the furniture though. I don't know if I really care about that right now. Right now I just kind of want to put some stuff over here that pops and looks nice. Technically planters, not vases, vases, but I would probably use these as something that would just like stick a fern in one and maybe some floral foam and some hydrangea in the other. I don't have any of those things right now, so maybe I really shouldn't have these over here. I mean, it does look good, especially if there were something in them, but I just don't think it really goes with anything else that's out here. It's a little bit, um, I don't, I don't really know the term, it just, it doesn't look right. I mean, it does, it looks really good if you're just looking at that spot, but when you look at everything else, it doesn't make any sense. Maybe a wooden bowl. Get some more wood over here. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Mostly just because I'm over it and I don't feel like doing this anymore. This doesn't have a hole in the bottom, so that's actually not a great idea. But uh, for right now, it's fine. I just wanted to get some stuff over here that pops a little bit better. Let me some. I have seashells. Pops the seashells back up here and spread those around. Keep them scattered needs something in the middle and I would prefer that whatever bowl is over here is something that has plants in it but for now this is fine I'm sure I've said that many times for now this is fine it'll do this is just a jumping off point I'm gonna be adding more to this over time and like I said I'm thinking I'm gonna swap those out with the white pineapple ones maybe the gold's grown on me a little bit and we'll get to that I have so much I need to do from this point on one I need to be inside with Toby because he doesn't like being alone and he's restricted to the kitchen right now and then need to get this edited and I have a family birthday tomorrow and having people over for dinner tomorrow and having people or I'm going out supposed to go out for dinner tonight with someone else so uh that's where I just I gotta go that's that's enough need to do some more picking up and stuff but you get the point I talked about this at the beginning of the video so I want to make sure to at least get the stuff out so that we could look at it I, I don't I'm not really into the gold 
and the bowl I think looks fine. I'd put something else in it. Right now, just this is good. I just need to get this stuff set over here. <laughs> I can perfect it later. Anyway, thanks for hanging out. Got some fun stuff done this week. Mainly being getting the shade garden all mulched up nice and heavily. I am still thinking about the idea of maybe doing a wall on this back end so I can raise it up some more. But for right now, I think that this is a good start. And I don't know if I mentioned this or not. We don't need to talk about it right now, but I did sprinkle some compost down before I put the mulch down. It's just to get the area ready for planting. And yeah, I'll handle this over the weekend. I think I talked about this in last week's video. This is very old and fragile, so I want to have someone on each side when we lift the top of the bird bath off because they have to take this apart to change the angle on it. That slope is kind of dumb. I was thinking about maybe moving it back a little bit, but in a garden bed like this, whatever goes in the middle is going to be taller objects, so I don't really want it too far back because then it'll get hidden by whatever the taller plants will be. It's time to go. I said I was going to go. I'm still talking. Okay, thanks for hanging out. Hope everybody's doing well. Having a great day, great life, and everything's going absolutely beautifully for you. Comment down below. Say hi. What's going on in your gardens? Oh, also, sorry. I completely forgot about Wednesday's video. It released because I scheduled it to release. I haven't even opened up the app to look at people's comments yet. I'm so sorry. I'm going to try and get to that. If I haven't, it's just because, you know, the Tobian. Just things are really busy this weekend, <laughs> this late week leading into the weekend. But I appreciate everybody. And I'm looking forward to opening up that video and seeing what people had to say about the new plants and about the new plants in this video. What are some of your favorites? Some of your favorite shade garden plants. Lots of fun stuff to choose from. This orchid's looking so good. I would move that over there, but I think it's going to get too much afternoon sun for orchids. I would like to do a big bowl full of Phalaenopsis orchids, but uh, I just don't see it working out very well. Oh, and I forgot, I have fairy lights to put inside this lantern, too. I should do that. I need to find... I'll get to that over the weekend. As always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye! Bye!